Today, we're talking about the trauma of supremacy culture and the practice of fierce authenticity as a way to support yourself in healing through it. Welcome to the Fierce Authenticity Podcast, where we're illuminating and dismantling all of the ways supremacy culture has impacted our relationships with ourselves, with source, and with others. Not just the overt ways, like racism, sexism, ageism, alcoholism, and all the other isms, but also the sneaky, cunning ways you wouldn't have thought of, like perfectionism, imposter syndrome, judgment, burnout, the not enoughs, and the hustle to achieve. I'm your hostess, Sharani M. Batuk, and I'm a relationship therapist, leadership development consultant, and author of the book series, Fierce Authenticity. Whether you're a returning listener or you're new here, I want to extend a very warm welcome to you and invite you to connect with me through the Fierce Authenticity newsletter community. If you're ready to rise above an inherited systematic invasion rooted in fear and lack so that you can calm and refocus those energies towards reclaiming a fiercely authentic personal relationship grounded in an abundance and love that is so radiant all your other relationships are elevated with you, then this is the space for you. I invite you to visit www.fierceauthenticity.com slash connect to join me. I'm so excited that you're here. And now let's dive in. Welcome back to the podcast. I am so excited that you're here back with me for another episode. Over the last few episodes, we've been talking a lot about trauma and supremacy culture and the trauma from supremacy culture over not only the last 500 years since Euro colonization and the transatlantic slave trade, but the trauma of supremacy culture that has its roots and its origins from 5,000 years before that, all the way back 5,500 years to the ancient Sumerian civilization. So that's what we've been diving into. And in the previous episode, we explored everyday supremacy, what it is, what it looks like, and how it's the sneaky and subtle things that happen and show up in us and in our relationships. Everything from walls of separation, imposter syndrome, perfectionism, the not enoughs, everything that we've been talking about here on the podcast, all of those are the sneaky and subtle ways that supremacy culture shows up on an everyday basis that fuels things like racism, injustice, and criticism amongst our partners and families and friends and judgment and all the other toxic patterns that we engage in in our interpersonal relationships. And not just toxic patterns in our interpersonal relationships, but quite frankly, all of the violence that we engage in on a mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and sometimes even physical level in our interpersonal relationships with one another. Not just one another, but also with ourselves. And so that's what we've been looking at over the past few episodes. And today I want to take us a little bit deeper and help make the link between what exactly fierce authenticity is and how it's applicable here. I know that when I 
first wrote my initial book, Fierce Authenticity, Show Up, Be Seen, Get Love, as I've shared about on the podcast, at that time, I hadn't quite looked at the larger systemic issues that contribute to the stories that we tell ourselves. That book, the first one, is purely based on all of the stories that we tell ourselves. And it comes, it looks primarily at our family of origins, what we learned in our families growing up, what stories we adapted about ourselves, because the human brain is a meaning making machine. It really wants to make meaning. And in the absence of things that make sense to us, we create meaning in a way that makes sense to us at whatever time and age that we're at. And unfortunately, Every single one of us on this planet has experienced some form of interpersonal and relational trauma. There's no if and or buts about it. I would love to have you show me someone who has experienced absolutely zero interpersonal trauma in their lives. And so because we've all had these experiences, and actually I want to back up because it's feeling important here to speak about how, you know, trauma isn't only the big things that happen to us or doesn't happen to us in the event of what was absent that should have been present in our childhoods and and growing up in our families and from the caregivers around us. But trauma is also In the words of Dr. Gabor Mate, who we will be talking about today, trauma is also having parents that are so disconnected from their own selves and their own authenticity that they do not have the ability to respond to a child's needs in the way that that child needs responding to. And so... And that also doesn't mean outright neglect. It literally means parents who just can't connect. And that's a really important distinction to make. Or parents who just weren't able to show up for us in the way that we wanted or needed them to show up for us. And so it feels really important to state that, that trauma isn't just the big T trauma stuff as we talk about in the therapy community and the trauma community and the big T traumas are abuse or rape or witnessing severe violence or murders or even being in a really near death experience. Those are some of the big T traumas and we don't necessarily have to have those big T traumas in order to be traumatized, especially not in our interpersonal relationships. And so it feels really important to say that before we proceed, because it's important that you understand that every single person on this planet has experienced some form of interpersonal and relational trauma. And so with that said, let's make this connection between trauma that originates from supremacy culture and authenticity, in particular, the practice of fierce authenticity. So as I was mentioning in the first book, I hadn't quite yet expanded to look beyond the family system. And as a social worker, my background and training is as a social worker, there's a part of me that's in judgment, like, oh, you should have known better. And thankfully, I do know better. And so really shortly after the publication of that first book in 2019, I ended up really getting curious about what about the larger sociocultural issues that contribute. Where did our parents learn those stories and their parents learn those stories? And so it really was taking it from the micro level and zooming out to look at the macro level, the microcosm, you know, that is us and our lives and our personal day-to-day interactions, and instead zooming out to the macro level of the larger societal reflection that, you know, what's playing out in the micro is that which is in the macrocosm. And so it really was to get curious around that. And it was to get curious around like, well, okay, yeah, we all have these stories about ourselves. They all show up in some form or another, and they all have similar themes. And where did the original relational rupture come from? 
where was it the very first time that we as a society, as a collective, had this experience of a rupture in our relationships that led to relational trauma? So that was the question that set me on the path of developing, doing lots and lots of learning and studying, especially about intergenerational trauma and epigenetics and everything that I've already been sharing on this podcast with you. And it really led into a deep dive and study of that as I was learning and developing the new book, my second book, which currently its title is still, its working title is still Fierce Authenticity 2.0, Supremacy's Impact on Our Relationships. There's some other fun and creative titles that are coming out and about in there, but for now, that's still the title for the moment. Follow me on Instagram at Sharani M. Batak, and uh, you will be invited to help vote and participate in the process of helping to name the book that I'm working on. And so anyways, coming back to, I really got curious, okay, we've looked at the micro level, what it is that we do in our own relationships and in our own day-to-day lives. And now let's zoom out and look at the macro level and what are the larger socio-cultural issues that have contributed to why we play out these patterns in our inter- personal relationships. And truly what I came to as I was moving through the process of learning and moving through my own healing, especially as I began healing through my own racialized trauma, what I realized is that what we're dealing with is so much bigger than the Euro colonization and white body supremacy that began in about 500 years ago. And it actually goes back so far that we've completely lost touch with the fact that it started 5,500 years ago. And there's a word for this. It's called decontextualized trauma. We're not going to go into that today, maybe in another episode. But really, it came from the original relational rupture. That is where this originally came from. And that did not start 500 years ago. That started at least 5,500 years ago when the first group of peoples invaded, overtook, and overthrew, and then followed to oppress and suppress another group of people. That didn't begin 500 years ago, y'all. That started 5,500 years or more ago. Because the first recorded war in history goes back to, I'm going to blank on the date right now, like the exact date, but it was somewhere in around 2700 BCE. All right, you guys, before common era, 2700 before common era. We're only in 2021 right now. And so really, it goes back well beyond our current era even, okay? So it's like this times two plus a few hundred years more. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about how far back it goes and how deep reaching it is. And what this experience has done, because when we have an experience of a relational rupture, without the proper repair of that rupture, we end up experiencing trauma. I'm not even going to try to sugarcoat it or lie. It is what it is. And trauma is what it is. And trauma, as defined by several trauma experts, is that there's too much, too fast of something that is too much to process. And this is just a paraphrase. And not enough of something reparative. And both parts of this are really important to understand when we're talking about trauma and the trauma of our relational ruptures. And so when we've experienced a trauma, in this case, a relational rupture, and we don't have enough of something reparative, we actually create adaptations in how to live with or survive in the world 
when we've experienced this type of experience or trauma. And those are whole other episodes that we're going to be getting into in terms of our responses. And I do have a preliminary episode that you can listen in on. It's the nervous system episode. Originally, it was, I believe, episode 3.0 of the podcast and it re-aired as one of the pre-season three episodes. And so you can very easily access that. And that was recorded way earlier than, than now. And I have so much more information about our nervous system and trauma adaptations at this point than I did back then. So that's kind of like your starter course. And then we will share more in future episodes. And for now, I just want you to understand that when we've experienced any type of relational rupture, when there isn't enough of something reparative, our brains and our bodies create a meaning and a story to adapt to that which occurred. And then it programs our brains and our bodies and encodes things in our memory banks to let us know, like, oh, this is dangerous. This is scary. And in order for us to survive or in order for me to survive, I have to do X, Y, and Z anytime I start to sense that this is happening. Okay. Now, at this point, the trauma is not addressed. We're merely creating adaptations or trauma responses to what is occurring. And what's happened is that the trauma of supremacy culture has led us to the adaptation of disconnecting from who we are and suppressing ourselves. The disconnection from our authenticity is a trauma response. It is a survival response. It is Our disconnection from our authenticity is a way for us to survive the trauma of supremacy. Dr. Gabor Mate, who I mentioned earlier, he says that we have two survival needs, attachment to others and authenticity, which is our connection or attachment to ourselves and our own gut feelings. So I want to let that sink in. Humans have only two survival needs, attachment to others and authenticity, which is our attachment to ourselves and our own gut feelings. Now, I have a fun little acronym for gut feelings, and a mentor of mine once shared with me that gut, G-U-T, God's ultimate truth, that what we feel, those gut feelings that we feel, the deep down inside feelings, not the surface level freaking out based on a trauma response type feelings, but those feelings and experiences that we have deep, deep, deep down inside of us that according to Dr. Mate, our our connection with our most authentic selves, our connection with our innermost selves, that that's God's ultimate truth speaking. And so when you have these feelings, then that's when you know you're in direct communication, like the divine is speaking to you. And it speaks to you through those feelings that you have deep inside underneath all of the surface level fear-based responses. And I feel like we're going to have to have a whole episode on that as well. But for the moment, let's just talk about this and stay here present for this. Now, humans are social creatures. Science tells this up, down, left, right, like there's no way to avoid this. Humans are wired for connection. And according to Dr. Mate, when we're faced with the choice between attachment to others or authenticity, we will choose attachment to others. And let's put this in a larger biological and evolutionary perspective, okay? 
Humans are wired for connection and we're social creatures and social beings because our survival depends on us being together in community. That is what our survival depends on. It's just making me think of back in the day when we were running from saber-toothed tigers. One human alone could probably not take on that saber-toothed tiger, but An entire tribe of humans most likely could have taken on that saber-toothed tiger. You know, we're stronger in numbers. That's really important for us to remember. And so humans are social creatures. We're wired for connection. And when faced with the choice between attachment to others or authenticity, which is our attachment to ourselves, we will almost always choose others because our survival in a group setting, our belonging depends on it. And this is where it gets really sneaky. And I like to speak to my clients about this concept of if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck, but you're being told it's not a duck, it is going to lead us to question ourselves and our own intuition and our own authenticity. And so if we're in attachment relationships where we're told, even though it walks like a duck, it looks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, it's not a duck, we're going to question ourselves, and we are going to disconnect from our authenticity. We're going to disconnect from our own inner knowing, from our own gut feelings, our own intuition. And we're going to do that Because as humans, we're wired to belong as social creatures and in groups. And so we will give up ourselves and our attachment to ourselves in favor of being in connection and in attachment with others. And so when we have millennia, of people who have been disconnected from their authenticity. And it feels really important to say this here. We do have well ancestors. We do have those in our lineages who have to some degree healed some part of this and they can support us on our journey. So it feels really important to say that though, yes, we have all been traumatized, we also all have well ancestors in our ancestry, in our lineage um, that have also passed on intergenerational gifts. So it's important that I say that here because I know a lot of times when speaking about trauma, I focus a lot on the pain And don't always look at the gifts as well. So we do have well ancestors. We do have people that have worked towards wellness and we have inherited their intergenerational gifts and not only the intergenerational curses that the trauma of supremacy culture has passed on. So it feels really important to say that before we move on. And Looking at that larger, if we just have millennia of traumatized people that are continuing to stay disconnected from themselves and their own authenticity, and they've developed these adaptations in order to survive under systems of oppression because of supremacy culture and the belief that there is one person or one group of people that are better than another, and not only better, but superior to while everyone else is inferior, then of course, we're going to have trauma passed down through millennia. So not even just generations but trauma passed down through millennia. And that's why we have a whole lot of people walking around out here so disconnected from their selves, from their gut feelings, from God, and from their own authenticity. And I say God, and really I mean a divine source of something greater than us. And so how does this relate to what we're doing here? The practice of fierce authenticity supports us in healing from the trauma of supremacy culture by utilizing scientific, psychological, and spiritual tools so that we can connect with our fierce authenticity. 
and live, love, and lead from that space rather than from a space that's still operating under systems of oppression from systems of supremacy. So essentially, the practice of fierce authenticity is the practice of radical authenticity, choosing to reconnect with ourselves and who we are. And when we reconnect with ourselves and who we are, we humanize ourselves, and then we can start to reconnect with others and who others are. And then we humanize them as well. And then as we do this, it continues to ripple out and more and more people start to wake up from under the spell of supremacy, cultures, trauma, and disconnection. And we all start to humanize ourselves and we start to connect again. And that is how we heal the world. It's the ripple effect. And that is what we're doing here. And as I've said, it's utilizing practices that weave science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that we really need on this planet at this time. And the practices of fierce authenticity start with you. And it begins with practicing fierce love for ourselves, fierce care for ourselves, fierce authenticity and owning who we are, and then fierce communication of our truth. And not fierce in the way that it's scary, not that kind of fierce. We're talking about the fierce that stands in its own power and operates from a space of love and kindness and care and compassion while being unmovable and unshakable in our personal power. That is what I mean when I'm speaking about the fierceness of these practices and what fierce authenticity is. And so those are the basic practices that start with you. And I speak about these thoroughly in my first book, Fierce Authenticity, Show Up, Be Seen, Get Love. And I highly, highly encourage you to purchase that book. You'll find a link in my bio. Um, (laughs) You'll find a link in my show notes to, to purchase the book. And... It will support you in understanding this micro level of practices that support you. And then there's the larger macro level about the practices around awareness about supremacy culture and how it shows up on the sneaky, cunning, subtle, baffling day-to-day ways like the imposter syndrome, perfectionism, not enough, judgment, criticism, walls of separation, feeling like we're such a fraud that we keep ourselves isolated behind walls. All of that is the trauma response. That is the adaptation to supremacy culture. And our awareness of that supports us in healing this on a grander level. And it supports you in changing the legacy, your legacy of one from trauma based on supremacy to one of hope and healing and love and kindness and creating the world that you truly want to see. And that is what we're doing here. I know that was a lot to digest. So what we're going to do actually is after today's episode, we're taking a week off so that you have time to process, digest, to integrate not only this episode, but also previous episodes of the podcast. Everything that we've done this season, it's an opportunity for you to catch up and get ready for when we're back in a couple weeks, for you to dive just a little bit deeper here with me. And it makes me think of a line from Danielle Laporte, actually, that when we don't rest and integrate, 
we end up spiritually constipated. And that's like my my paraphrase of it. But really, we need time to rest and we need time to integrate. Otherwise, we do become spiritually constipated. And I and actually any kind of constipated, right? And I don't want to do that to you. And so that's why for your sake and my sake and the sake of the collective, we'll be off next week, giving you an opportunity to digest and integrate. And we will be back with new episodes after that. So until then, take really good care and we will be together again soon. I want to take a moment to honor and acknowledge the amazing support team that helps make this podcast possible for you. Starting with Diego Velasquez, our podcast editor and the talented artist who created our custom music. Ana Olvina, my wonderful assistant who creates all of our beautiful graphics and the transcript of every episode, which you can find over at www.fierceauthenticity.com. Biana Sandich, who writes our amazing show notes and does it so well that I bet you couldn't tell it wasn't me. The talented Jillian at Epoxy Studios, whose photography is our cover art and pretty much every other curated image that you see of me on social media. My husband, who puts up with me when it's 11.30 p.m. on a Sunday night and I'm like, hey babe, I gotta record a podcast episode. Like, right now. Is that okay? My higher power, whose divine wisdom flows through me to bring these messages to you. And last but not least, I want to thank you, my listener, so much for listening in. If you'd like to join the podcast support team, some ways you can do so are by rating and reviewing the podcast, sharing it with everyone you know, and, if possible, making a financial contribution through the link in the show notes so that you, too, can be part of the team elevating this podcast and making it possible to bring to other listeners like you. I'm sending you so much love, and we will be together again soon.